<laughs> we love you. So, do you want me to start? Yes, yes, you take it away. Thank you so much for uh, coming tonight. We'll, we'll clap one more time. Thank you. Okay, can, every, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Perfectly. And you, can, and you can see me okay? The light's okay? Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Well, look, it's a huge honor, honestly, to speak to you today. Thank you, John and Katie, for the invitation. Most of you, even though I was given a very gracious introduction by John, most of you have no idea who I am. So let me give you a bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Robert Ferguson. I am from England originally, so forgive the accent, but that's, that's where I'm from. I've been in the full-time ministry for the last 50 years. And I've been a minister at Hillsong Church in Australia for the last 34 years. So that gives you a context. And I'm currently uh, sitting in my room in the afternoon tomorrow. So I'm speaking, <laughs> I'm speaking to you from the future. <laughs> so by definition, this is a prophetic message. <laughs> John uh, said that my wife and I have had the privilege of working alongside um, both John and Katie for many years while they were in New York. And honestly, it is a huge blessing and honor to be here today. Uh, just to, on a personal note, he mentioned Amanda. Amanda and I have been married for 48 years. In fact, this year we celebrated. 50 years uh, having met. We met on the March the 17th, 1974. So um, we've known each other a long time and we've got three adult children and seven grandchildren. To give you an idea, my eldest grandchild is currently learning to drive. So we are now professional grandparents. <laughs> of course, none of that uh, qualifies me to speak to you. The only thing that qualifies me to speak to you is what John has already mentioned, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a few days ago, I was talking to John on FaceTime, and he mentioned that you were doing a series on Romans 8. And he asked me uh, tonight to share my thoughts. And of course, there are numerous angles that I could take. He didn't give me any indication as to what you've already spoken about. You could, of course, speak about the love of God, that nothing separates us from the love of God. You could speak about justification, and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You could talk about life in the spirit and its challenge with the flesh. But I have chosen a subject that perhaps you won't immediately think about, but it's central to Romans chapter eight. And that subject is the resurrection. And I want to talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and specifically its relevance for us today. So we're going to look at one verse, Romans chapter eight and verse 11. And it says this, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. I'm not sure if it's on the screen, so if you have a Bible, you can turn the page or the screen over to Romans 8, and we're going to concentrate on that verse. You may say, why am I talking about resurrection? But N.T. Wright, who is one of the great New Testament theologians, says Romans is suffused with resurrection. He says, squeeze this letter at any point and resurrection spills out and hold it up to the light, and you can see 
Easter sparkling all the way through. Mm -hmm. Another theologian, Daniel Kirk, uh, says that resurrection is the melody of Romans. And he says it is the key theme that unlocks the entire epistle. So I'm going to take the title of my message from another verse in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, which says this, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was raised to life for our justification. So if you're taking notes, and I see a few of you are taking notes, that could be uh, the title of this short message. And then, as John said, we'll throw it open for questions if you think that would help. But if you don't mind, I'm going to pray at the beginning of this message and really pray that God speaks to us about this, because we often think that resurrection is an Easter message, but actually it's a life message. It should be a part of everything we think, everything we speak, and everything we do. So I'm hoping that my short message, my few thoughts are going to help you understand a little more about the power of the resurrection. But let's pray. Father God, thank you for these wonderful people in this auditorium in Hawaii. I pray, Father, that even though I'm in another part of the world and on a different day altogether and a different season, I pray that the eternal word of God will change both my life and their life as we journey together through this chapter. We ask it, Jesus, in your precious name. And everybody there said, Amen. Amen. Well, let me start by telling a simple story. In 1926, a Russian Orthodox theologian wrote a book called Mysticism and the Eastern Church. In it, he tells a story of a speech given uh, soon after the Bolshevik Revolution. The revolution in Russia took place in 1917, and this speech was given in 1926. So the nation was just learning about communism. A Russian revolutionary by the name of Anatoly Lunachatsky was giving a speech called Religion, the Opiate of the People. That expression was taken from his hero, Karl Marx. He was speaking to a crowd in Moscow of about 7,000 people. And in the speech, he said, Christianity is a myth. And science and Marxism is the new reality. Mm. After this long speech, he reluctantly gave people an opportunity to respond. And a young Orthodox priest said he would like to respond. And Lunachatsky said, I'll give you just two minutes. And he said, it won't take that long. He stood on the podium in front of 7,000 of his fellow citizens in Moscow, and he just shouted across the crowd, Christ is risen. And without hesitation, even after years of communism and a transformative revolution, the entire audience responded, he is risen indeed. And the Orthodox priest got down off the platform, having answered in two statements the speech that said Christianity was a myth. The truth is that in 1926, in Moscow, the reality of the resurrection was embedded 
into the very fabric of every heart in that audience in Moscow. The question remains, is it as real for us as it was for them? Every Easter in our church, I go around the church and I purposefully shake hands with people and say, Christ is risen. My hope is that they will say, he is risen indeed. But usually they give me blank faces. Some say, happy Easter. Some don't know what to say at all. They're thinking of Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. But when we hear the phrase, Christ is risen, our immediate response should be, he is risen indeed. This Easter just passed a radio interviewer in Sydney asked an old woman on the radio, how are you? She was very old and obviously infirm, but her response was wonderful. He said, how are you? And she immediately said, nothing that the resurrection can't sort out. <laughs> Again, would that have been your response? My response, is the resurrection front and center in our thinking? Wow. Well, we're going to look at Romans 8, 11 and what that means. But in order to understand it, let's look at the verse before, because we need to read it in context. Romans chapter 8 and verse 10 says, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. So if we're going to talk about the resurrection, we need to first understand the paradox between life and death. If you've become a Christian, the spirit of God lives in you as the book of Romans says, you have eternal life. You've passed from death to life. So you are a recipient of life. Life is in your bones. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. But whether you like it or not, we live in a broken, damaged, fallen world. And as a result, we are dying. And John said, I've just celebrated my 70th birthday. As you get into your uh, eighth decade, you realize that you definitely are dying. In fact, I have just read a book by Oliver Berkman called 4,000 Weeks. And that is all you and I have. If we live to 80, we have four thousand weeks of life. We are dying. And I think if we're going to look at resurrection, we've got to understand this tension between we live in a mortal body, but we also have a hope in eternal life. It is what the theologians called kingdom now, but kingdom not yet. We have all the promises and the blessings of life, but we also have the, the reality of death and the hope of resurrection. The Victorians many years ago used to speak about death all the time. Death was front and center in their lives, but they never talked about sex. Nowadays in the 21st century, we talk about sex all the time. We never talk about death. I think we've got to have a different balance. We need to talk about death and we need to talk about the finiteness of life and the hope of eternal life. C.S. Lewis, one of my great heroes in the faith, said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. We need to have this hope 
of resurrection in every cell of our body. Okay, so with that in mind, the paradox of life and death, how does the doctrine of resurrection affect our lives? Let's look at the verse again. Romans 8, 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. I'm going to read you a quote by a man called Brooke Westcott, and I'm going to use his three conclusions about the resurrection as a foundation or a skeleton for the next few minutes. He says this, the message of the resurrection sums up in one fact, the teaching of the gospel. I'll just stop there for a minute. We may think that Paul's message is all about the cross, the cross and him crucified. He said to the Corinthians, I'm going to preach Christ and him crucified. But actually, there are many pillars in the Christian faith. The incarnation is one. The crucifixion is another. The resurrection is a third. And of course, the ascension is a fourth. Were it not for the ascension, we would have no Holy Spirit. But Bruce, Brooke, Brooke Wesker talks about this is the heartbeat of Christianity, the resurrection. It sets everything apart from every other religion on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Our founder not only died, he rose again and stayed alive. Westcott said, it is the one central link between the seen and the unseen. And then here are his three statements. To preach the fact of the resurrection was the first function of the evangelists. To embody the doctrine of the resurrection is the great office of the church. To learn the meaning of the resurrection is the task of not just one age only, but of all ages. If you're interested, I have quoted uh, that quote from this book, The Cross is Not Enough, by Ross Clifford, who is a principal of a Baptist theological college. And it's if you're going to read one book on the resurrection, that would be a good one. But let's have a look at those three statements. Firstly, he talks about the function of the evangelist. The function of the evangelist, he says, is to preach the resurrection. I don't know what your, your sermon was on last Sunday. I know your theme is Romans chapter 8. But if you're tackling the book of Romans without talking about the resurrection, it may be that you've missed the point. Mm -hmm. Resurrection was central to the preaching of the apostles. If you go through the book of Acts, Acts 4.2, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. This was the news. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the promised Messiah, the Deliverer, the shepherd of the people. He was alive. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify, what to? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. And this wasn't just Peter and John and James. This was also central to Paul's preaching. In Acts 26, when he's speaking to Agrippa, he's speaking about the resurrection. In Acts 17, when he goes to Athens, he's not discussing philosophy. He's speaking the resurrection. It's the heart of our faith, and it's the heart of this book. Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. This is the message of the gospel. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. This is what we believe. It sets us apart from other groups of people meeting in Hawaii tonight. We believe that Jesus Christ is alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Walter Martin put it like this. He said, what was the central truth of the early apostles preaching? What was the stimulus to the miraculous growth of the early church? What was the energizing force which spread the gospel across the face of the earth? The answer to all these questions is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He is risen was the victorious cry of the early Christians, and they spread it to the ends of the earth. Right. Now we talk about it on Easter Sunday, and mm. that's about it. But for them, it was everything. So it's the message, number one, of the evangelists. But also, secondly, it's the task of our age. He says the task of our age is to give or learn the meaning of the resurrection. So the first thing is, is the resurrection central to your message? But the second thing is the hope of the resurrection, the heart of our life. In this passage in Romans 8, it talks about the spirit living in us. That's the gospel. God comes to dwell in us, Christ in us the hope of glory. That's what we're proclaiming. The God of the universe comes to dwell in us and he energizes us with his life. So the spirit of God comes to dwell in us. But then it says in Romans 8, 11, he will give life to our mortal bodies. This again is a paradox because my body is getting older. Bits of it are starting to decay. Things uh, are not working like they used to work. But I have life within me, resurrection, eternal life that's giving life to my mortal body, even as I speak to you. So on the one hand, I'm a flawed being with death in my cells. But on the other hand, I am made in the image of God, redeemed with the life of God in every cell of my body. And the task of our age is to learn what that's all about. And to be honest, it's about hope. We live in a disastrous, complex, messy, hopeless, depressed world that you of all people should be overflowing with hope. That's what this chapter is all about. It's what Romans is all about. Verse chapter 8, verse 24, in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what we already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You and I should be overflowing with hope when people tell us about the economy or the challenges or the political landscape or the wars or the rumors of wars, we should be bubbling over with hope because we've Come encountered on. the Come living on. savior. Come on. Come on. Romans 15, 13, again in this book, I this is one of my favorite uh, texts. May the God of hope, Romans 15, 13, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When people come in contact with us, they should walk away having encountered hope. John Stott remarks, uh, again, a great theologian, every, uh, every Christian is a citizen of heaven and an alien and exile on earth, a pilgrim traveling to the celestial city. He said, we were born in nakedness. We're going to die in nakedness. We are pilgrims between two moments of nakedness. So we should travel light because we're people of the spirit. We look oh forward to our real home, which oh is heaven. 
We are we are between two advents, the first in Christ, the first advent of Christ and the second advent, his second coming. Uh, we're between the redemption of the world and the consummation of all things. It's a wonderful tension. Alistair McGrath talks about this as he says, you and I are like tightrope, uh, uh, sorry, trapeze artists in a circus. We've let go of one bar and we're flying through the air to catch the next bar. Wow. That is our reality, but there's no safety net. This is a flight of hope and faith, and we should be overflowing with it. And it all is birthed in the promise of the resurrection. Because as uh, Paul said in the book of Corinthians, if Jesus isn't alive, isn't alive, we are of all men most miserable. Okay, so the third big idea that Westcott talks about is the office of the church. And I just want to uh, hang on this for a few minutes. He talks about the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He says the office of the church, and that's you and I, is to embody the doctrine of the res resurrection. So it's the message of the evangelists. It's the task of our age. It's the embodiment of the church. Romans 8, 9, it says, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus, and I hope you have, and if you haven't, this is a great opportunity for you to do so. But if you've given your life to Christ, you are going to be born again of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is going to come and dwell inside of you. That is the embodiment of the doctrine of the resurrection. This is what uh, this should be central to our life. So can I ask you this question? Is the life of the resurrection actually evident in your individual body, in your individual family, in your individual community. Because the office of the church, according to Westcott, is to embody that doctrine. Now, as I draw this to a conclusion, before we throw it open for questions, let me uh, give you a bit of my background. Um, John very kindly said that I was a scholar I don't see myself as a scholar at all. I am a biologist. My training is in biology. I trained as a biology teacher. In fact, my degree is in animal behavior, which I often say wonderfully qualifies me to teach in a Bible college. Amen. <laughs> but one of the things biology is, or zoology, is taken from two Greek words, zoe, life, and logos, the word. So it is, in effect, the word or the study of life. So by moving from being a biologist to a minister, I have moved from the study of biology to the study of biology, the study of zoology to the study of zoology. I am a studier of life, specifically, Ooh resurrection life. Now, it, I'm not going to give you a, 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 a summary of the signs of life, but if I were giving you a biology lesson, I would talk about the eight signs of life, the things that distinguish a dead log from a living animal. And I want you to think about for a minute, are you alive? Is your community alive? Is it embodying the resurrection life of Christ? Now, this passage in Romans 8, 11 through to verse 17 highlights five or six things that are indicators of life. So what I'm going to do just very briefly is to go through those five things and say these are indicators of resurrection life. If you're embodying resurrection, this is what your life should look like. 
and they marry the same biological signs of life. The difference between a log and a fish. All right. So ask yourself this question. Five things. Number one, energy. A sign of life is growth from within and the release of energy. All living things grow from within. Now, I can move you and challenge you from the outside, but what you need to experience is life from the inside. A crystal can grow from the outside, but only living things can grow from the inside. And what they do is to release energy. So you say, well, you've been preaching for 50 years. Surely you're a little tired. Well, I'm certainly tired. But Colossians chapter 1, verse 29 says this. I work laboring, struggling with all, listen, his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Wow. If you're getting weary, if you're getting tired, if you're feeling like giving up, if you are uh, drifting out of Christianity, out of community, if you're choosing comfort over over commitment, if you're choosing convenience over calling, it may be that you've forgotten that Jesus is alive in you. He is your source of energy. So energy, have you got energy or do you have to be persuaded all the time to come to church, to come to the evening meeting tonight, to read your Bible, to pray, to tell your neighbors about Jesus. If you have to be persuaded, maybe you're not living with resurrection life inside of you. You can't stop a plant growing. It's got life inside of it. And that life is more powerful than concrete, as you have discovered in your backyard. When the weeds push up all of those concrete bits and you think, how can a small plant move a huge chunk of concrete that I can't move myself. That's because it's got life inside of it. All right. Second, second thought, purity, purity. One of the signs of life is the removal of toxins. All living beings excrete toxins. Here it is in the text. He says in verse 13, put to death the misdeeds of the body. If the spirit of Christ is in you, you automatically remove anything that's flesh, anything that's world, anything that's poisonous, anything that's toxic. You will immediately uh, react to gossip, to criticism, to backbiting, to lying to anything that represents sin or the world. Everything inside of you reacts. Why? Because you're alive, because Jesus is in you. So if Jesus is alive in your community, is it full of energy? Is it full of purity? Beautiful. Third thing, generosity, generosity. These people in Romans 8 verse 14 were led by the Spirit of God. They're moving forward. They're progressing. That is a sign of life, movement. If you've had the privilege of going to Israel, you will know that the Sea of Galilee is alive, but the Dead Sea is dead. The Sea of Galilee receives water and gives water, receives water from Mount Hermon, gives it to the River Jordan. The Dead Sea receives water from the Jordan but gives it nowhere. There is no movement. And unless you receive and give, you're never going to be alive. Jesus put it like this. Come to me, John 7, 37, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The spirit of God will flow out of your life. You've received, so you give. Freely you have received, 
freely give. It's a sign of life. If you've got to be persuaded to tithe a tenth of your increase or to give money to the projects in your church, there's something wrong with your life source. Jesus has given you life. He himself has come to dwell inside of you. The least we can do is to be generous. So I'll be looking for energy, purity, generosity, Number four, are you still with me? Yeah, yeah this is great. Yeah. Maturity. Maturity. It says in verse 15 of Romans 8, uh, do not go back to being slaves so that you live in fear again. What he is saying is don't backslide. Don't go back to your old way of life because Christianity is about development. It's about reproduction. All living beings develop and mature. We need to go on to maturity. Maturity. We need to reproduce ourselves after our own kind. One of the tests of life is whether we're telling people that Jesus is alive. That is part and parcel of our maturity. We need to grow in grace. These are life signs. Dead things don't reproduce. Dead things don't develop. Dead things don't move. Dead things don't remove toxins. Dead things don't grow. Dead things don't release energy. But Jesus is alive in us. So there should be energy, purity, generosity, maturity. And finally, you'll be glad to know sensitivity. It says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Verse 16. We are led by the Spirit. Christians who understand, who embody the life of the resurrection are automatically aware of the Spirit's voice. They want the sheep know the shepherd's voice. They want to be led by him. They want their, the Spirit testifies with their spirit that they are God's children. It's a sign of life. All living things respond to stimuli. You don't have to persuade a plant to move toward the light. That's what they do automatically. It is a sign of life. If you're alive, you're going to walk in the light. You're going to move toward the light. You're going to want the light. Why? Because you're embodying the resurrection. So there are five things, and I'm sure there are many others in that passage, energy, purity, generosity, maturity, and sensitivity that are signs of resurrection life. So what's your reaction? We come to the end of a short message on the resurrection, just like Paul gave a short message on the resurrection in Athens. And it says in Acts 17 and verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, Others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council, but some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. When we speak on the res resurrection, indeed, when we embody the resurrection, those are always going to be the three reactions. Some of them sneer and walk away. Some of them say, tell me more. And some of them believe and are changed forever. So let's just, as I hand back to John, test you to see whether you've heard me. Christ is risen. He is risen. <laughs> All right, that's it. Over to you. That was amazing. Have you ever seen me in shorts in church? <laughs> no, it, it's, uh, I'm glad I had a strong coffee before the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Robert, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Can we thank Pastor Robert? I, I, I submit to you as one of my pastors and elders, but I have a question. Can you... Right you prophetically 
because you're not just a teacher, you're also a prophet. And you have prophetically given me a word in season. And I know we're over Zoom. But to seal this message with something prophetic, maybe you feel in your spirit for us. I, I We opened up tonight. I know many are, are battling, are fighting to, to be all that God's called them to be. And... I, this message is so timely for us. And what's what's so interesting is this weekend, I, my part that I have to hit next is verse 10 and 11. Oh. oh. <laughs> so he just gave me a lot of good news. Yeah. <laughs> if you hear me even on Sunday, just, just let me take 24. <laughs> well, this, can I... Can I just say, um, John never told me what verse to choose. I had no idea which verse he was preaching from or what subject he had taken. So maybe the Holy Spirit is saying something to you all. Can I, the first thing that comes to mind in terms of encouraging you prophetically is that a seed has the potential of changing the world. From one seed comes a great forest. Although you can see a seed, only God can see the future forest. Can I just say that you have all the potential to change your community, to be the people that God wants you to be. All you need all a seed needs for the growth and the release of its potential is the right conditions. Mm -hmm. In the right conditions, the seed is going to grow and produce another seed and eventually a forest that can overtake the world. So can I suggest you pray and create the right conditions. You can create the soil which is necessary for a seed to grow. You can be good soil, open hearts, open minds, willing hands. That's what we need. Jesus in John in Matthew 13 talked about the parable of the sower and he talked about good soil. I believe this community in Hawaii is good soil. Yeah. And this meeting is filled with seeds, potential. Some of you do not believe that you have any potential, but even the smallest seed has the greatest potential. Yes. And if you place yourself in the right soil, don't withdraw from community. Don't live on your own. Don't be independent. But if you plant yourself in good soil, you will have the capacity not only to change your world because a seed becomes a plant, but you can change the world. What you need to do once you're planted in this community is to pray for rain. Zechariah says, ask me for rain. Chapter 10, verse 1, ask me for rain. It's there in the text. God wants to pour out his spirit on your community. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12, ask for rain in season. And when the rain comes, the seed in the soil will grow. But here is the challenge. John chapter 12, the seed must die. If you're going to fulfill your potential, you have to die to your own opinions, your own passions, your own ideas, your own desires, and you've got to trust that God will release his potential. Jesus said about his own life and ours, the seed must die. So that's what came to mind prophetically for you and this community. So back to you.
Okay, now pray for us, please. <laughs> Father God, thank you for John and Katie and the wonderful community that is gathering both here tonight, but also on the weekends. I pray, Father, that you would do what you said. Would you send rain on their land in season? Yeah. And I pray that when the rain comes, it will find both good soil and good seeds. And I believe and pray for harvest that will change that part of Hawaii, but also extend to other parts of the world in Jesus' name. Amen. So back to you, John. Over to you. Okay, so uh, I guess my only question, because we don't have really any questions, is when are you going to come to Hawaii? <laughs> um, look, won't, it won't be this year, but if um, I would really love to come, if for no other reason that I need to go out for dinner with you and Katie again. Aww. So that would be um, that would be a highlight. As you know, and I know this is going to shock your community, I live in Australia, but I don't like beaches. So coming, <laughs> coming to Hawaii will not, it, the beaches won't attract me. So it won't be for a holiday. It will be for you wonderful people if I come. But I would love to come if I can. This this is very true. Everywhere I ever see him in the world, he he would come only when it was cold. That was that was very. You went on a trip to like Antarctica or where'd you go? You went to Alaska. It was Alaska? Uh, and the Antarctic. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. a biologist. It's it's a great opportunity to see stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think we're gonna open it up for questions. Is that okay? I feel like that word was. I think we got a lot to chew on. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor Robert, can we one more time? We just want to thank you so much for being here. Can I ask you a favor, John? Could you pray for me before I go? Yeah. Jesus, we just um we just thank you so much. Yes. God for this just word and season. God, when, when I think about Pastor Robert, I think about all of the seeds that he has sown. God, all throughout the earth. God, there are countless men and women like me that have been impacted for decades. And God, I just pray, God, that God, there's an inheritance coming. There's a, there's a beautiful heavenly position and place that you have prepared for him. But God, I thank you in his own family, God, that he, God, he would see the rain. God, he would see the rain in his children and his grandchildren. God, I pray that he would prosper in every way. God, not only from his mortal body, but God, from all the branches that extend from him, God. God, I thank you what the enemy meant for evil, you will use for good, God. God, I just... God, we bless him today. God, we bless him. God, our community here in Hawaii, we just bless Pastor Robert and Pastor Amanda. We thank you for their life of service. God, we are eternally grateful for them. God, many times when I speak, I, I can hear his words in my mind and in my heart. I thank you, God, for the gift he's been to us, God. And God, I pray for many more years. God, I pray for the most abundant, most fruitful decade yet, God. God, as he heads into this season as Caleb, God, holding up Joshua's arms, God, I thank you, God, as he holds Joshua's arms, God, God, that he will inherit more land than he can possibly imagine spiritually. And Father, I just thank you, God, for him and Amanda. God, I, I pray for beautiful years, beautiful years, this decade and these next several decades, just beautiful years of celebrating all the beautiful seeds they planted, God. God, I honor them today, God. I think I know many around the world do, and we're so thankful, God. We can't wait to have them here, God. Yes. Bless them today. Bless the rest of their day, their afternoon tea, whatever they do, yes. in Jesus' name, tomorrow and in the future. Amen. 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 Love you.
I love you. Thank you, uh, John and Katie, for the invitation. And thank you, wonderful people, for being such a great um, group of people tonight. Your hunger and your passion is wonderful, and I appreciate it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Love you. Love you. <laughs> How was that? Wow. That's pretty amazing, right? Uh, I didn't know where he was going in the beginning wow. with the Russian thing. And like, <laughs> I was like, man, I haven't heard of him in a while. I don't know. <laughs> He's lost the plot, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much to, to chew on um, and to think about. I just, uh, I love those five signs, you know? Um, I think maturity and purity are the two things that stand out to me right now in this room, like maturity and purity. And I, I would pray that we just feel convicted about that. Like, let's live in a way that's just honorable. And, and I love the idea that, um, yeah, that, that thing with the crystal is so powerful. That crystal